Hi, I'm Philip Kahn-Gutanda. I'm the librettist uh, for the piece. And how we got to work together, um, I first met Shinji at a cocktail party. <laughs> and we talked, and we found out that we were both from Berkeley and Japanese American and roughly around the same age. Then I heard his music. Uh, he um, composed the music for a ballet called Raku. And I listened to it and I thought it was extraordinary. And so I contacted Shinji and we talked and talked and talked until I found something that uh, he responded to. And that was a poem called Body of Eyes. And sent it over to Shinji, and then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I've always heard of Philip Gotanda. He's famous all over the world. And, and, um, and we became friends first. He is the nice. couple in the wrong balcony, and they're looking at the night sky, and they're sitting wide, and they see an object in the sky moving. His writing has made me write differently. In a very brief period, he captures so much emotion, so much intensity. I sense a state and awaken to. We both listen. Then to hear it today with the singers come alive and what I think is really critical also of, of working with you is to leave things up to those who are performing it live because that's where all the magic I think comes. You play the original and then play your way. This is the fan. So the, the text fan. is unfolds like a fan, right? Yeah. So that's what I wrote and this is what Brenda wrote. So much better. Yeah. Uh -huh. I really appreciate this project, of course, you know, to work with Tucci and with Victor. It's opened up a whole new world for me in theater and to cross fertilize like this is just brilliant. Love and love got lost in the worm. And it just was going inward for both of them. <laughs> this is a really sad song. <laughs> I see. going on in the world in terms of API and uh, BIPOC, LGBTQ, in relationship to um, violence, uh, anti-Asian violence in particular in regards to uh, this project. And I think one of the things I've always felt and I, is that what can you do as an artist uh, to respond to these things? And the thing you can do is do your art. You know, do your art big, bold, you know, uh, and that's how you respond, I believe, as an artist. Oh, uh, and with, 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 without saying anything, all of you just somehow work together so beautifully. It's just, it's the greatest thing to work with real pros who just do it, do it, you know. You add everything. You add the most important parts to this thing. So I'm very grateful. Thank you, Philip, for this opportunity. Thank you, Shinji, for all the music. A man and woman staring into a night sky, watching an object amongst the stars. It's moving, then stops. They share glances and looks, then moves again.
The man and woman seated at a funeral. They sit side by side. Silence. Hold. Fade to black. Hello, my name is Victor Milana Maog. I'm the curator and executive producer of 2G's Inflections. What you'll see today are projects that were rehearsed and taped within four hours' time. Forty artists strong who came together against this backdrop of Asian American hate and violence and put together stories of humanity, about the great range, depth, joy, resiliency of our community. That's the best answer that we have. How do we show more of ourselves so that people can see us in the most vivid way? This is what this project's about, about our own freedoms, our own agency, our own liberation, but also a chance to share moments in our life, moments that aren't always seen, but hopefully you can relate to. This is Inflections. Thank you for joining us. Hi, my name is Rendara Santiago. Um, uh, when I was asked, invited to be part of this, um, I was really excited. Um, and it didn't come right away, but as soon as I realized that I wanted to write about my sister, it kind of it was really easy to picture um, exactly what I would want the two characters to talk about. My sister always jokes, so I have two sisters, and one is a year younger than me, and this one is for her. We, she always jokes about the fact that she's not in my plays. So I just wrote this one just for you, Kea. Hi, Whoa, hold on. Hmm. Hey. What's up, Maya? Hey, what are you doing? I'm packing. Oh, where are you going? Work. The one in Cali? No, no, no. That one starts later, like end of summer. Portland first. Oh, no, 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 no. Back home, then back up for work, then Portland, then come back, then Cali. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it's annoying going back and forth, but I think I'd get tired being not home for so long either way, so it's cool. I'm excited. How long are you going for this job? 
It's the teaching thing. It starts tomorrow. It's long. It's like two months. Oh, damn. You all right? You got so tired last semester. Yeah, it's going to be different this time. Less students. I won't overcommit like last time or give my email. So I'm not getting messages off the clock all the time or open myself to energy thieves. Yeah, that's good. You got to set boundaries. I know. You always make everybody's problems your problem. I know. <laughs> You're so cute. <laughs> they know sometimes. Oh, ooh, look, I'm renovating the kitchen. Oh, let me see. Hmm? <laughs> I'm gonna redo the cabinets because like look they're ugly right so I'm gonna change this laminate mess it's such a mess I want to make it like like wood and the accents and all the appliances wood cute like birch or mahogany or um uh, I like oak like this like this Mm, which one? Like golden oak or red oak? Oh yeah, that's pretty. But it's gonna clash. No, because I'm redoing everything. Jed's gonna paint the walls and I'm gonna make like the floating shelves like more organized. Like I don't like how cluttered they are right now. There's no flow. I wanna put in like like plants and make it look all like just way prettier than this. Yeah, that's nice. Your place is so pretty, Maya. It's so cool. You like it out there? Yeah. I'm going to go to Home Depot later today. Hmm. Where's Jed? He's at school. They do classes in person twice a week. Wait till he comes back and go with him. It's OK. I'm going to put the order in. They'll deliver. You got to be careful. I'm scared. You going around by yourself? People lost their damn minds out here. Yeah, I'm OK. I can just go. It's quiet here. And you in Florida? Come on. We're being extra vigilant out here. How many attacks have you seen out here in New York? In our city? Come on. It's crazy. Just go with Jed. Wherever you go out, big, strong, white guy, nobody will mess with you. I can handle myself. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I go with Jed to the gym now. He's working on my arms. I'm getting really strong. Look. Oh, word. Let me see the guns. Yeah, look. Yeah. You see? You see the line? Oh, shit. Yeah, you cut. Damn, Maya. You brawling now, huh? You gonna go super sane on these races? You already know. <laughs> you talk to mom. Pita Nisi's mom is in the hospital. What? I need to call her. Yeah, call her. Maya, you okay? Yeah. Um, you were in my dream last night. That's crazy. You're the third person to tell me that this week. Really? Yeah, yeah. B-Man texted me that, and uh, I can't remember the other one. But what happened? Um. Okay, first, we were in the ocean, like, swimming. And you know I'm, I'm kind of scared of the ocean. Really? I didn't know that. Really? Yeah, like the sharks and riptides. I'm really scared. Wow, I guess the last time we swam together was a family trip. When was that? Like middle school? Yeah. <laughs> but you're always at the beach. Yeah, eighth grade. Yeah, I like the beach, but I don't like swimming it. <laughs> okay. So what else happened? You, um, we were in the ocean and there were like these big waves, like really big, like, like 20 feet high or something. And they were crashing over us. And then we went underwater and it was all like clear and blue and we could breathe underwater and see all the fish. And when we came back up over the waves, like they passed over us, like they didn't even wet us or anything. Wow, that's so nice. That's good. Maybe we weather the storms together. I'm glad I was in your dreams where something bad gets less scary. Yeah. And then it changed. It was like a school. I was in a school or something with mom. And I had to go. Like, I wanted to leave. 
So I took mom's car and I'm driving and there's someone in the back seat, like, I don't know who, and I didn't want to turn and look like, like I thought it was like a ghost probably, you know, like that's why I didn't want to turn around. Maybe, but it's probably not a real ghost, Maya. You know, Sunny, you know how like when we were little, like I saw them for real. Yeah, grandma's house. Yeah, so I'm scared of them, Sunny. I hate ghosts. I know, I know. That's why I'm saying it's probably not. Give me the rest of your dream. So I was driving and I got really nervous because the wheel was not letting me control it. Like, like it had a mind of its own. So I kept breaking and I had to keep breaking over and over or it was going to drive me onto like oncoming traffic. So I, I couldn't make the wheel turn for me. So the only thing I could do was like break. Jesus, that's terrifying. So you said it started with mom and then there was someone in her car? In the back seat. Yeah. What are you doing? I, I just, I pulled some cards. I don't know, I, I had to grab the deck. Oh, you do tarot? Like you can read it? Yeah, I've been studying them and it, it's getting easier. Especially like receiving clarity while I practice. Um, I don't know, whatever. What's it say? What's it say? Well, First, I think that whatever happens, no matter what, as soon as your gut is like, nah, I don't want to do this, follow it, Maya. Your impulses are always correct. And you're extremely intelligent. And like, I know we make fun of you so you don't believe you are as intelligent as you are, but I said it once and I'll say it again. You know, you could have worked for the CIA, right? And this is dumb. I'm talking out of my ass, but I'm not. But the situation with mom, like if she partners with someone you don't get a good vibe from, especially if you don't know her well, don't do it. It'll implicate you. Um, okay. Like, I think you're clairvoyant. Uh, but you are, just accept it. Not because you need to use it, just because I want you to just step into your light, Maya. You're beautiful and special and good. Not that deep. I know. It's like hypocritical coming from me, but you're so smart, Maya. You don't have to hide it anymore. And you're not selfish. You really care. And you take care of us and you're really thoughtful. And you're fun and you know how to make people happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I love you. I love you. I'm scared. I'm always here. You ever need me? I am always here, I promise. What about when the ghosts come when I'm sleeping? I'll dream myself there and fight them. You know, I'd be fighting them in my dreams. You get sleep paralysis. Yeah, I hate it. But I'm getting better at it. You just gotta remember you're strong. You can't be afraid to say what you know. That's your power. That That's what I mean. You're clairvoyant and you know things innately. So don't hide it, okay? Um, you know, there's things I don't remember. Yeah, like past life shit? No, like remember when mom and dad made us go to their therapist? Like um, she told me that I need repressed memory therapy. What? I don't remember that. Yeah. Dad said not to. Mom wanted me to, but dad said not to force me, but it could hurt me. <sighs> yeah, you can remember on your own. Good. I'm glad dad did that. Yeah, but I don't know what it was. Do you want to go to therapy? I don't know. I'll find you a good one. A sliding scale one. I want to do the psychic medium thing that you did. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, but I'm scared. Okay, I can be there with you. What if, like, she says there's a ghost attached to me? There's nothing like that. Are you going to try to remember things? You should record your dreams, like when you wake up in a dream journal. Okay. Yeah. I'll meditate, maybe. Don't force yourself to remember. Huh. 
Do you remember our babysitter when we were like four and five? You were three, I guess. Oh. We had a babysitter? Yeah. When we were little, she was the neighbor's daughter. She lived on the fourth floor, Evelie. No. You don't remember her at all? No. Okay, well, this is just to warn you because I'm... I don't think she did anything to you because she always locked you out and only did it to me, but just so you know, your memories could have something to do with sexual abuse, okay? I don't think she did. I, I really don't, but she did it to me and you didn't really know, but you knew she was always locking me in rooms with her and you felt really left out and isolated. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Okay. I remembered a while ago, like in my early 20s. I just want to make sure you're okay. And that you're safe no matter what. Okay. There's no ghosts, Maya. Because I'll protect you. Um, so remember last time and we were talking about my dream? Yeah. So I forgot to tell you, that night, I dreamed you came over and we were like hanging out here, like in the living room. And then somebody knocked on the lanai, like on my screen door. And it was a ghost, Sonny. It was so scary. And it just kept knocking and knocking. And we were so scared. And I just prayed. Like the one, the one that dad told us, grandma told him to do when he got cursed by that buha. So I just prayed and it started to shrink smaller and smaller and I woke up, but it was so scary. Oh, that's crazy. Well, don't be scared. It's not a ghost. What if it is? No, no, but it's crazy because I had a dream after our call too. Like not really a dream because like. I wasn't fully asleep yet, but I went into paralysis and I saw this same figure I dreamed about only a few times. Like you and me are standing across the street from our old house, the haunted one, and I hear this knock like someone had wood right behind my ear and knocked, but it's in my head. And I look and in the attic at our house, like in the place we used to sleep, the windows are all yellow and there's a shadow waving at me. Mine is a shadow too. And it waved at me. I just prayed. Oh, yeah, I didn't wait back because I know if I do, it pulls me into the room with it. So I just woke up immediately. You think it's the same one? Yeah, I dreamed it before. No, 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 like you and me dreamed the same shadow. Oh. oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but have you been writing in the journal? No. I'm going to send you one. Can you write in it for me? Yeah. Okay. I got a dream catcher. I've been having a lot of nightmares lately. I don't know. I'm tired. Like I can't sleep. Like I wake up every hour. That sucks. What, is something going on? No, but it's okay. I don't get paralyzed like you. That is scary. I mean, you have to sleep. It's not good for your health. Yeah. Um, Sunny, you know how to help, how to help with like anxiety? Why, are you okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. You can tell me, Maya. Just tell me how to handle it. Or like, help other people handle it. I'm bad at it, but yeah, meditating and just remember you're safe and you're okay. You're probably feeling anxious because you're so happy, Maya. <laughs> you work so hard and you love Jed and he's good to you. You love your beautiful house and you're by the beach. I don't go to the beach though. It's kind of a far drive. Well, still, I think it's hard to like, Accept that you're okay, that you're happy, and you don't have to, like, with us. I know it feels safer to be unsafe, you know, like, to have shit about to hit the fan all the time, and now that you're finally chilling, you can't, you can't like, relax because it just feels wrong. But you're safe, Maya, and loved, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, remember when Dad was gone? Yeah, like, after I left? Yeah, when they divorced. Oh, after I came back. When we moved. Okay, yeah, what? Well, that was the first time he felt like my sister. When you were at mom's? How, I barely saw you guys. 
That's when you started working all the time. Well, I was in school too. I slept like three hours a night. Remember? Because you thought moms was taking extra money from you and called the bank and they told you it was going to my account. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you didn't get mad at me or blame me. Yeah, I knew you wouldn't admit it, but you didn't even say sorry. But you didn't care about that. You didn't ask me to apologize or ask me to give it back. You asked me if I felt bad and if I worried about you. I mean, that was a lot of money. Do you know how much you took? It's scary. It took you over a year to notice. I was heavy in my coke spiral back then. But I knew when you called me that mom told you. And she told me to admit it and give it back. But you called me and you just told me you loved me first. And you were more worried about me, about my heart. That made me cry. When I think about you back then, it hurt thinking you thought you didn't care about people. I knew you were just believing all the bad things we said about you. I hate people! <laughs> Yo, you were the OD evil for a minute there. Like, 14? But even when you were little. I know, I just said. You had grandpa's grouch brows, but you had this, like, you had a way of guarding yourself even when you were little. I told you. I would do things on purpose sometimes to make you cry because that's the only time you let me hug you. That's fucked up. You were scary. Like, you were so little and so angry for no reason. <laughs> really? Yeah. I don't know. You... I don't know. Yeah. Hey. What? Uh, hold on. Jen is always anxious. Like, I don't know what to do. Oh. I mean, just listen to him and assure him. I do, but it's like he doesn't stop worrying. He's worried I'm going to leave him and he's going to fail school and he's going to fail and be alone. Damn, I'm so sorry, Maya. But you love him. It's okay. He has you. But nothing I do makes it better. He just won't stop worrying. So he has bad anxiety? Yeah, he's scared because he loves me so much. I'm going to leave him like... He believes everyone he loves will leave. It doesn't matter if they love him. That's hard. Yeah. I just want to make him better. Well, don't force it. Just be there and listen. And get him to accept that he needs to trust you. I tell him all the time. Be patient. Don't rush it. This stuff takes time to accept, to believe it, you know? I do all of that, Sunny. Well, let it be, Maya. You're not responsible for his happiness or his ability. To it hurts play. me. Like, like it makes me sad when he gets like this. Maya, you are loving him so well. You are doing everything you can. You're doing the best job anyone could. You're so good to him. So just calm down. You're doing great, Maya. You're doing everything you can. You're not doing anything wrong, and you're not the reason he's sad or anxious. Just, just keep loving him in a way that makes you happy. If you work on your happiness and love people the way you do, time will work it out. Okay. I love you. I love you. I'm grateful you asked me, Maya. Thank you for trusting me. When are you going to visit? I'm coming up for my birthday. Well, maybe I'll follow you back down. OK. Take me surfing. Are you going to bring your boo? I don't know, maybe. If it feels like it won't fuck everything up. You always do that. Fuck it up? No. Keep people at a distance. You never get vulnerable with the ones that want to be with you. Okay, I have therapy tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> what happened to the Aquarius? Ha, the Aquarius is a round. 
and super patient and maybe I'm taking too long. So maybe speed things up. Maybe. We gotta bring Bean to the beach. Oh, we gotta bring her back around the family. I'm sure she misses being with all the cousins. I miss her. Me too. And Chewy likes his girl. Oh, they made it official. He was teasing so hard. It's so cute. Her jewelry is nice. She's special like him. I'm happy they're good to each other. Let's see each other a lot this summer. Yeah, I love that. It's been too long. Stop working so much. Yeah, I will. It's been a whole year since all of us got together. Like you, me, Bean, and Chewy weren't all together since my last birthday. Yeah, no more of that. I'll see you soon, Maya. Okay. I love you. I love you. Right in the dream journal. I'm going to order it right now. Oh, and send me your new address. I don't have it. Okay. You better FaceTime me when you see Bean this weekend. Okay, I will. Don't be scared of ghosts. You talk to the shadow. If it's not, if it's not a ghost, I'll try it. No, 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 you should talk to it. Your powers are stronger than mine. You're the only one that gets messages from them, though. Okay, we will do it together. I will try talking to it. Okay, make sure you close the circle after. Oh, I don't have protection barriers. I gotta do that. I have a grid. Bada. So it doesn't attach itself to you. <laughs> okay, yeah, I won't mess around. I love you. I'll call you later. Okay, bye, Sunny. Bye, beautiful. I love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. I wish I didn't have to write this play, but something has been happening since time immemorial, and I had to give voice. The violence against our Asian and Asian American community, against me, continually stuns me. It should stun everyone. Life changes, yet remains the same, but the wrongs do not need to repeat themselves. Please watch, listen, learn, and help stop hate, and racism. Thank you for watching Darwin's Arch. Scene one, morning, suburban home kitchen. On the dining table, three bowls steaming with jook, Chinese rice porridge, a framed photo. Helen enters, shuffling on her walker. Ruth follows behind her. I feel funny. Well, <clears throat> you should use the wheelchair. It's too soon for the walker. I feel funny, not crippled. What? Headache? Stomach? Fever? What? Ruth grabs a BP Don't monitor and that. thermometer from her pouch, then takes Helen's vitals. Don't do that. Just get up. I need to see if you're- I'm not a yo-yo. Mom, you've had three pelvis fractures. Arbor has a cluster. You're lucky I got you home before lockdown. Why'd you put me in that place? It was a prison. You agreed. It was your spa apartment. I had to go back to work. It's called a community. Look, I got you out of there in the nick of time. Six of your neighbors died two weeks after you left, you know. I saved you. I don't need a spa apartment. I have a home. You have no right. Right, to right. You're in your own home. You're safe. Be grateful. I have enough money. I'll hire someone. I don't need you. Now go back to New York. We can't let anyone in the house. Mom, we can't go out. This is a lockdown. I'm under house imprisonment now too. Look, everyone is dying out there. The count is almost 600,000 dead. Do, 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 do you understand? I speak English. I'm not a coolie hooly. I understand everything just fine. You used to be nice, you know. <laughs> Where's your dad anyway? Um, <clears throat> he's not here. Tell him to come upstairs now. He can't. 
Why not? That son of a bitch. Uh, he left. Liar. He taught you that. You never lied before. Your chook is getting cold. I hate chook. Since when? Before I was born. No one is born with hate. Eat, please. I'm under your thumb now, too. <laughs> You're just like him. Well, what happened to feeling funny? You know, that bastard sold my water for glasses. Only four left. He's trying to kill me. I told you. They broke by accident. I was washing them. Now just eat your chook, please. You know why Titleists couldn't sell their golf balls in Asia? They packaged them in fours. Four and ten mean death. I told them, change the packaging to six balls. <laughs> Sales shot up off the charts. Did I get a dime? Not nope. even a thank you, assholes. And he left me only four Waterford glasses. <laughs> Where the hell is your dad? I don't know. Your joke is getting cold. You better come back, bastard. Your daughter <laughs> is driving me nuts. What's wrong now? I told you, I feel funny. Something's funny. Um, look at the calendar. What day is it? May 17th? Mm -hmm. Why is the 17th circled in red? <laughs> no doctors. No more poking. I'm perfectly fine. Your anniversary. Remember? I surprised you both with the China trip a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How the hell did you find the Paramount? I think I felt they tore down all the dance halls and it looked the same. Like when I first met your dad. 1945. My grandmother sent a message to the Paramount right in the middle of our third dance. What was that song? What was it? Uh, Glenn? Glenn something. Miller? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was the worst. Best night. Felt like a rainbow in a cloud. Maya Angelou. What? Mm. That's who said rainbow in a cloud. <laughs> so that's the caregiver's name. No, no, no. There's, there's no caregiver. <clears throat> Never mind. Just try the joke. You might like it. I should have gone home that night. Well, I'm glad you didn't. You didn't live long then. If you're a woman and Chinese, you didn't want to live. I should have gone home. Try the chook, okay? I've been cooking it all morning. Mm -hmm. What happened after the third dance? He was a terrible, terrible dancer. <laughs> well, not with you. I just wanted to dance. You know how corny and klutzy he is? Dorky, but a handsome dork. He sweet-talked the hell out of my grandmother. 
Yeah, well, why'd you marry him if he was such a dork? I owed him money. <laughs> I was dancing, not whoring. <laughs> well, I don't get those why. fuckers. They took everything. They hated us. No reason. If you're told to lie, you lie. If you're told to kill, you kill. If you're told to hate, you hate. Lemmings. Thousands of lemmings with no minds of their own. Insanity's poison. Once you take it, there's no turning back. If you're dead, he didn't get my grandmother, mother, and sister out of the house. Those fuckers would have ganged. I should have gone home. What, to, to get gang raped, mom? I owe you, dad. In war, people die. You chose to live. War doesn't give you chances, just consequences. Your dad understood. Chinese get Chinese, blacks get black. You'll never know. You'll never understand. America made you forget. I should never have raised you here. Tell your dad to come up for breakfast. The juke is getting cold. Scene two, 14 months earlier, morning. Ruth swipes her Metro card. A young brute shoves her to the ground, runs through the stall, steals her fare. Hey! She swipes another fare, goes through the toll stall, stands on the platform, bam. Young Brute comes out of nowhere, punches Ruth in the face. She falls to the ground. She's bleeding. Fucking chink. You killed my parents, bitch. Ruth walks away. He grabs her again. Subway comes. Ruth jumps aboard, runs to the end of the car. Her face throbbing. She looks up. Young Brute is on the subway car, running towards her. Two white men, seated, watch, say nothing. You don't belong here, bitch. You killed my parents. Ruth wraps her hands around the holding pole, hurls her legs into the air as young Brute approaches. She kicks him in his solar plexus. He falls, clutching his chest. <laughs> Subway stops. Young Brute crawls off the car. I think that bitch killed him. He's gonna need an ambulance. <laughs> what? We should hold her till they come. <laughs> he just punched me out. Hey, what's between you and your husband's your thing, lady? What? Yeah, you already killed his parents. Well, what the fuck are you talking about? Just talk to the cops when they get here. Hey, I've never seen that shithead before in my life. That's what all wives say. <laughs> it's, it's not my husband, you assholes. You just attacked me and you dickless pricks didn't do anything about it. Are you going to call the cops on me? Well, he, he's not your... Uh... He is not my husband. Oh, God. Hey, 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 put that down. You don't have a right to take my picture. Oh, yeah, you want to bet? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you charged as accomplices when the cops come. Hey, we should go, let them deal with her. The police officer approaches. The white men chuckle, fist bump them as if old buddies. They chat. An officer comes up to Ruth. Do you speak English? Ruth's cheek is the size of an orange, her eyes bleeding. Hello? Yeah? No, I can't talk right now, what? What? When? Was she okay? Which hospital? How did she fall? Okay. Okay, okay, it's gonna take me a little while to get there. I'm in New York, it's about five hours away, six or seven maybe with traffic. I, I, yeah, I'll get there as soon as I can, as soon as I can. Oh, good. You speak English. I won't need a translator. Scene three, back to present day. Ruth cooks, Helen watches TV. Lunch? I haven't had breakfast yet. You had chook. I just got up. I did not have breakfast. It's afternoon. Where's that woman? 
She didn't feed me breakfast. We need to fire her. Yeah. No one else is here, Mom. It's just the two of us. Why are you lying? I just saw her. She sleeps in that other bedroom. I don't like her. I don't like her at all. Yeah, well, I sleep in the other bedroom, okay? You and I are the only ones here, Mom, for the past 14 months. You do this on purpose. You just want my money. You need to go back to New York. Helen grabs the TV remote, changes channels. I need to watch the news. What kind of a monkey business is that Cheeto doing today? Well, hopefully no more monkey business. He's not president anymore. I don't remember going to the polls. We voted by mail. It was too dangerous with the virus. I've never missed an election, you know. Your dad would never let me. Who'd you vote for? You're not supposed to ask me that, you know. <laughs> How'd that Cheeto become president anyway? Uh, the people voted for him. Americans aren't that stupid. You live in a different world now, Mom. <laughs> Why are you making noodles for breakfast? Long life noodles. We need them. Out the window, Ruth sees a trespasser digging holes with a shovel on her property. She rushes outside. Helen watches out the window. Hey, what are you doing? Go back in your house. What, well, what are you doing? Do you, do you have an ID? Are you from the county? I don't have to answer nothing. Uh, you're on my property, so I'm gonna have to ask you to leave now. Go back in your house, Karen. You don't belong here. Look, you leave now, or I'm gonna call 911. Yeah, go ahead and call, bitch. I'm not afraid of you. I'm doing my job. Go back to China, you fucking Karen. Uh, can you say that one more time, please? Go back to China, you fucking Karen. Yeah, um, 888 Glad Hill Road. Uh-huh, I don't know, he won't show me any ID. No, not yet, but he's volatile and he has a shovel. Black torn sweatpants, a uh, black pullover sweatshirt, it's stained uh, late 20s. He's kind of short. I'm five foot four and he's shorter than me. Yeah, okay. All right, I'll, I'll go now. Just stay on the line with me, okay? I don't trust him. Ruth dashes in front of his car to take a photo of his license plate. Man chases after her. Get away from my car, bitch. No, did you hear that? Did you hear that? He has a shovel. Are you there? This bitch is stealing my car, dispatcher. You hear that? Trespasser swings his shovel at Ruth, who stops it before it hey! hits her in the face. Hey, where, where are they? Well, 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 come on, are they on their way? A neighbor standing by his door witnesses. He does nothing. He calmly makes a call on his cell phone. Two squad cars screech. They take Trespasser aside. He's calm, a total Jekyll and Hyde turnaround. Ruth looks down at her hand. It's bleeding, throbbing. The officers talk calmly with Trespasser, then drive away never talking with Ruth. Ruth goes back into the house. Who was that? Why did he call you Karen? What, why are the police here? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Just, just uh, let me finish cooking the noodles. Your hand. You should have stayed inside. You shouldn't have talked to him. Why do you have to be so aggressive? It's not worth it. Look at your hand. We've lived here for 60 years. We've never had any problem until you. Mom, just, just. Now what happened to you? I didn't raise you this don't, way. Don't, don't, don't say another word, okay? Just, just be quiet, please. Why do you always have to start trouble? I live here. What will the neighbors think? Why did you? Mom, please stop. Asian hate crimes have increased at least 300% since the pandemic and could be higher since the Atlanta massacre of Asian women in March. Many attribute the rise to COVID being called Kung Flu and China virus. Last week, two elderly Asian women were waiting for a bus and were stabbed. A week before, an 87-year-old Chinese grandmother was brutally beaten in San Francisco, but she fought back. 
Today, President Biden signed the Asian hate crime bill that passed in Congress. Ruth, your hand is bleeding. Don't worry about it. Tell your dad to come up for lunch. It's not here, Mom. He needs to come upstairs now. Mom, he's not here. He's dead. And it's been three years already, okay? You lie. Why do you lie? He needs to come upstairs now to protect us like before. He's never coming up, Mom. Okay? He's dead. Ruth, you're bleeding. Mom. Your hand is... I am fine! Why is your hand... Will you please stop? Ruth, do they... Mom, Mom, please, please, please. I can't. I just can't. They... They, 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 they who? What? What do you want to know? What are you talking about? Do they, do they hate us again? A shocking occurrence happened last evening. Darwin's Arch in the Galapagos has collapsed. This iconic natural formation, which has stood the test of time, corroded due to erosion. Darwin, who studied animal species, documented the animal kingdom's instinctual survivalist evolution, creating the well-known theory of the survival of the fittest. My name is Dean, and you're going to be seeing my play, Story, a play in 20 measures. And I guess what I would say to you is uh, Asian American stories aren't always about being Asian American, and they aren't always about being queer and transgender, which I am. Um, sometimes they're about all of those things, but they're also about time and life and death and loss and family and just the weirdness of being alive. So I hope you enjoyed the play. A Solitary Light. One, this is the first measure. I'm here and you're there and I can only see as far as this light, but I think you can see the whole thing. Is that true? Two, a kid dies at the age of 20 and it's a tragedy because you don't know what you're doing for the first 19 years. You're just figuring it out. And by 20, you, you think you have a doubt, but you don't because that doesn't come till 30 or 40, but you think you have it figured out and you're just about to start living and bam, you're dead. I need to slow down. I, I, I know I'm talking too fast, but that's how your 20s are, you know, fast. Everything happens fast because you're living and there's so much to do and you're trying to do it all. Date everyone, sleep with as many people as possible, work different places, live different places, and it's a lot. And you still can't really see much past the little circle of light that's you, but you think you can. You think you can see the whole world. Three. But sometimes, even if you're only 20, there comes a time when you want it to be over, when you're just a lot of talk, when no one's ever loved you and no one ever will. Your parents stopped loving you at the age of 11 and your dog died when you were 17 and you've been on your own since then and you smoke some cigarettes and you do some drugs and still it's a long way to go before it's supposed to be over it's 
fucking hard. You don't believe me, but it is. It's fucking hard. It hurts, and you can't explain why, and everyone wants you to buck up, and sometimes it's a razor blade, and I pull it quick across my wrist, or deep across my throat, or a plastic bag over my head, less mess that way, or maybe getting hit by a subway would be instantaneous, and one minute I would be in the air, and the next I would look down on my body, and it would be a, a mangled mess, and and I'd feel bad about that, bad that someone had to clean that up, but at least it would be over. But then something happens. This happens. There's this other light that I hadn't seen before, and it's not coming from out there. It's coming from me. And no one can see me because I'm practically dead, but it doesn't matter because all that matters is my own little candle, my own little song. La, 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 la. That was four. This is five. Oh, hi. Hi. I like your light. Thanks. You're really sexy. Smart. Beautiful. It's my light. Do you want to be friends? Do you want to be more than friends? Um, I don't know. I, I just want to be me right now. Is that OK? Oh, yeah. Sure. Of course. That's what I want, too. Six. I feel like I've been here forever. I have this light, I can see people, I can see you, I can see you. Seven. Have, have you ever seen a naked woman? Sure. For real, not like on TV or something? <laughs> yeah, of course. I've never seen a real naked man. Not, not a real one, like right in the same room with me. Uh... Can I take off your clothes? Would you mind? Uh... I, I don't know. I guess not. Are we gonna have sex? The guy takes off his shirt. I don't know. They unbutton his pants, pulls them down. The guy stands there in his shorts. Can I touch it? What? No! He covers himself with his hands and turns away. I just, I just, I've never... I don't care! God, I, I'm not just a rod, you know? How would you like if someone were to grab your junk and fall it and didn't care about you at all? I, I'm sorry. I know what that feels like to have someone touch you and not care about you at all. Don't you dare feel sorry for me. I know I'm sexy. I know how to move, how to look. I can make things happen with just my eyes. I can give a guy a blowjob that will make him leave his wife. I know who I am. And the truth is, I don't even think men are all that attractive. You're the one who I want to be with. You're the one who makes me want to be better. But you, you fucking feel sorry for me, don't you? Well, fuck you.
eight. I'm an adult now, no one to count on but myself. I used to have a brother, I still do, but I used to think that we'd be close when we grew up, like best friends. And my parents are still alive too, so I'm not really an orphan. But does it count if they don't talk to you? I always thought that parents loved you no matter what, but it's not true, you know? Nine. I remember when this was the only light in the dark. Now everything is bright and I can't see anything at all. 10. We look at both Guy and Lola. Lola is more defiant, while Guy looks kind of sad. They go to Guy, sit behind him, and hold him. They hum a song to him. It's something he knows, an inside joke. <laughs> he stands. They aren't expecting it, but he turns and hugs them tight. They are touched by this. Mischievously, they both sneak up on Lola, then pounce. <laughs> Get off me, you freaks! <laughs> Sometimes you have to give it away. Give what away? The thing you want? Story walks away from them. I love it. Our time together is more than half over. I should probably have a nervous breakdown or midlife crisis or something, but I already had one of those. I used to want to grow up really fast to be on my own. And then you hit this part and you wonder where your parents are, why they aren't there for you. You know, when you're a kid and they never let you leave, they never let you grow up, then you do grow up and they don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. This one's for you, mom and dad. They said it was unconditional, but it was fucking conditional. Mm. And Lola's parents, she has to pretend to be a little girl with them when she sees them, which is not often enough because they refuse to come here. She always has to go there. <laughs> this one's for you, Lola's parents. Okay, now. That's enough of that. I'm not done. And this one, <laughs> this one's for Guy's parents who fucking got a divorce and fucking remarried. And the only fucking thing they can agree on is that guy has nothing like his father. And I would like to say, thank fucking God for that. Lola and Guy take away the bottle. Hey. Guy kisses Story on the forehead, holds them gently. Lola kisses Story's palm. You make your own family that before it's not the same it's not fucking the same no it's not but still you make your own family 13. i missed one you're hungover lola takes off her sweater and puts it on story Guy takes off his glasses and puts them on story. They hold hands. We've decided to have a family, have kids. It took us a while to all agree. One of us would want to, but the others would be against it. Not enough money, not enough time. I didn't want to be the dad my dad was to me. I didn't want to have girls. They get so fucked in this world. But then we decided we were a family. 
and we wanted to put some love into the world. We're not the most traditional family, and I'm not telling you because I'm asking your permission. I don't really care if you like it or not. I never care what people think. That's the truth. <laughs> but me, I'm just too old to care anymore. Answer a young man. Hope. Their child. Fourteen. Lola and Guy stand with hope. Hope is shy around all these new strangers. And clings to Lola and Guy. This is our child, Hope. He was stuck in the foster system. We took him in, we do our best. We can't give him a lot, but he doesn't seem to mind. Guy is a good cook. He makes macaroni and cheese and it's not from a box, but I like it. And he also makes me pancakes with chocolate chips on Sundays because that's what God would eat. And Lola, Lola taught me that if someone hits me or picks on me, I should hit them very hard somewhere that won't leave a bruise, like they're nuts. And, and story, they say that music can make you cry the kind of tears that are good, that clean your window so you can see into the world better. And sometimes they sing to me when I get nervous, real quiet, so no one else can hear, but I can hear. Fifteen. I love Hope. And I love Guy. He's got the sweetest eyes, even when he's being a moron. And Lola, well, she's a strong one. You don't want to get on her bad side. She holds us together like a tree trunk. And the shit she's been through. Nobody should have to go through that. But she did. And she's here. And it's ragtag but it's a family. Thing is, I can't get this thing to work. Maybe it's just so bright in here that you can't see it. Maybe the light is just, you know, not very bright anymore because it's old. It's not like I'm out of time yet. 20 measures and we're only at 15, so it's close to the end, but not the end. It's not like I have forever anymore. Sixteen. Guy and Lola and Hope come and go around story. They're tending to everyday things, exiting and entering, getting dressed and undressed, coming and going. Sometimes I think of that time, you know, when I was at the beginning of it all, everything seemed so important, so alive, so horrible, and so desperate. Sometimes I find myself thinking of razor blades and plastic bags and subway trains again. Thinking of jumping off the edge into, into I don't know what, just jumping. And then the lights would go out and then bam, maybe I'd be saved at the last minute and then darkness and then a little light would go on. A little light in the darkness. Seventeen. This is Dakota. Guy and Lola take story and gently lay them down, crossing their arms across their chest. Eighteen. They died in one of those random shootings that happen at the post office. Or maybe they died from stage four cervical cancer. It was over in four months. 
or maybe they died in a drone strike that killed the wrong people, or maybe they got hit by a car coming home from the grocery store. Or maybe they lost their light and went looking for it and got lost and couldn't find their way back. They taught me how to dance. Nineteen. Story had the coolest flashlight. It was so bright, even in the daytime. You could see it across a crowded room of people. Said, I'm here. Come home. They used to point that damn light at me all the time. They used to say, you're kind of handsome, even if you're an idiot. They used to say it was beautiful. When I would cry, they would lick my tears and tell me they were sulk. Story wasn't my mom or my dad. I still think about my mom and wonder why she left. But my mom was really fucked up. She didn't even know who my dad was, and then she couldn't ever get it together to take care of me. But she was my mom, and... I think about her all the time, all the fucking time. Story wasn't my mom or my dad, but they were my, my story. They were mine. They, Twenty. Twenty. 20. Hi, my name is Max. I think what's usually seen is the story of immigrants making it in a new country. But what I find less talked about is how the rest of the family those who stayed behind, how they feel watching their loved ones start a new life in a new country, how they might perceive the imagined better life in that new country, and how that in turn makes them question their own life in the place they've always called home. 2021, lights up on Zhao Fei chiming a small bell. Shu Shu enters. Don't ring it. Oh, okay. Zhao Fei sits back down on a stool and continues throwing stacks of paper money into the fire pit. Don't throw it in stacks like that. One at a time. Like this. Now she'll get it. We see Nai Nai somewhere up in the clouds, sipping tea from a busted, rusty metal mug. She wears a watch. She feels something in her jacket and takes out money. Back in the good old days, there was no money. She throws the money back down into the fire. 1977, Nai Nai puts a pot onto the fire. Almost midnight, Da is up early, studying. You up early? Oh, woke up an hour earlier, but I couldn't fall back asleep. The baoji is steaming in here. Thanks, Ma. Are you sure you got enough sleep? I'm fine. Switching from the day shift to the night shift takes quite a toll. It's all right. Who enters? Han Jiang, where have you been? Out. Where? Around the city. How am I supposed to keep track of you? Don't. I come back, don't I? Past midnight sometimes. I'm safe. It's fine. Safe? Are you really safe? I don't know what you get up to in the city, but soon you might end up like your father. Calm down, Ma. It's over. Ma is dead. <laughs> Something lets up and that makes you think it's okay to run around doing whatever you want? I already graduated from school. I'm an adult. You are 15 and they truncated school for the revolution. You know what? Great. That's great. Hey, Big Brother, why don't you ever say? Mom should be, shouldn't be nosing around into my business, right? Don't bother him. He is busy studying. Come on, Mr. Big Shot. Trying to get into college? 
You never say much. Let's hear what you have to say. Twenty twenty one. Nai Nai lies in bed while Shu Shu is in the other room. Ba is on the phone with Shu Shu. Shu Shu is terse. So, um, how is she? I, I saw your text in the group chat about the cancer diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I had some questions about that. Yeah. Does mom know about it? The diagnosis? She knows. And how does she feel about it? She's doing well. I see. What's she doing right now? Napping. It's 1.30 p.m. over here. Oh. I didn't realize she'd still be following her routine given the news. She's fine. So, what are the next steps? I'll take her to the hospital tomorrow. The doctor will see if the tumor is operable. Okay. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Uh, no, I uh, don't think so. All right, then. Well, yeah, uh, keep me updated. Yeah. Shushu hangs up. 2021, Zhao Fei sifting through drawers. Where is it? He goes to the door and looks outside, checking to see if anybody is there. He goes back and continues scouring the room. Nai Nai, previously lying dead, stands up. When I die, you must come back to Nanchan and find my will. You're not going to die soon. I put the will in the center of the desk, in the center of the middle drawer. There, you'll find it. Zhao Fei finds the will. He reads it to himself. My will is as follows. Cremate my body and scatter my ashes across the Gan River. Divide my inheritance as follows. Out of the 300,000 RMB, give 275,000 to my elder son, Han Hai, which will be given to Zhao Fei in place of his father not being here and give the rest 25,000 to my younger son, Han Zhang. 1999, Ah, talking to Nai Nai. Signed, Lu Jiali. Is that okay? This should work. Who walks in carrying Ba's luggage? Jeez, you're already in China. Why do you still have to do that crap? He's just trying to make sure. The local police all know us. It's still the same officer Liu sitting in that same stupid counter. Well, with an American passport, I'm technically not part of the family. <clears throat> you got some heavy shit in here. It's because I have gifts. For you, little brother, I have... Ba opens up the luggage and takes out a nice bottle of Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels Select. What does that mean? It's what Americans drink. A straight Kentucky whiskey. And for you, Ma, I have a watch. Oh. <laughs> it's stainless steel, mechanical. I know you've been needing one. Fancy, fancy. Now you two enjoy those while I go to the police station to give them the letter. I'll go over to the police station. Ma, no worries. I can do that. No, no, I'll do it myself. Uh, Ma, I, I can go along with him. Han Zhang and I can both go. No. No, you must be so tired from the flight. 16 hours. I slept the entire way. I feel fine. I need to go out and exercise anyway. Nai Nai takes the letter and leaves. 2021. Zhu Shu finds Zhao Fei in Nai Nai's room. He puts the wheel into his pocket. What are you doing? I was looking for things to remember her by. 
old photos, you know. You couldn't wait until after the ceremony, until we moved your grandmother. You already started cleaning up some of her things. I am the one, was the one taking care of her. You put in your pocket. It's something I think we should discuss after the ceremony. Take it out. I found her will. What does it say? It's about the inheritance. She takes the will and reads it. Two hundred seventy-five thousand to a son who isn't even here. So you're supposed to take the money. Do you even have a bank account? Foreigners can have bank accounts. Did she tell you about the will? Yes. Is that why you were rummaging through her room before we even took the body away? She told me to come and immediately find it after she died. You couldn't just wait. Look, I'm just following orders. Who are you to do that? You think you belong here, but you don't. 1999, Ba and Shufu. Shufu takes a sip of the Jack Daniels. Good. Hmm. Eh, uh, this foreign liquor is weird. It's not my thing. <clears throat> I'm not that big of a fan either, but I thought you might like to try American liquor. How much was it? Uh, around 100. RMB. USD. Oh, doing quite well for yourself then. I'm doing okay. I wanted to buy something nice, something truly American. Are you truly American? Enough to be kicked out of the Communist Party. Really? Party members can't go to America, and they especially can't hold a US passport. He hands it to Shushu, who flips through it. Well, good thing I'm not in the party. You can come visit, you know. The apartment is small, but- <laughs> Nah, uh, not for me. Howard Zhao, nice name. It's not like they'll be able to pronounce Han Hai. That's uh, America for you. So you can speak English now? I'm okay at it. How do you say beer in English? Beer. Hmm. Beer. <laughs> what about umbrella? Umbrella. Umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Strange English words. I can learn English from your daughter. She's funny. Oh, she gets along well with your daughter. I jump forward in time. 2006. They get along well with Meng Ying. Must be busy having two. Well, two's not too much. It's more than we can have. Having a baby boy in the mix now definitely makes it a handful. That's probably how mom felt. Oh, how's she been, Ma? She was really excited to see you. Post 2006, Ah uh, gives Shushu a Game Boy Color. Here, this is for your daughter. It has Pokemon on it. Ah, oh, Meng Ying will love this. <laughs> Zhao Fei really likes her. He got his sister and his cousin to dote over him. And they all get along despite the language barrier. <laughs> Kids don't speak Chinese that well. Well, they grew up in America. <laughs> Chinese who can't even speak Chinese. Better make sure you don't lose your Chinese. I grew up in China. Nanchang specifically. I noticed you haven't been speaking our dialect. Well, I want the kids to understand Mandarin, so I speak that more now. Did you forget your own dialect? Well... I will... I will... Uh... You forgot. How much money you make? Oh, it depends. Ballpark it. Well... Ah, gives Shushu an iPhone. Here, this is for your daughter. Ah, thank you. This must be expensive. Oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. 2021, a few days later. 
The doctor said it's stage four. So what did they suggest? They said she's too old for surgery. So for now, mom said she wants to stay at home. Can she be by herself? She's getting weaker. Can you stay with her? I have to go to work. The factory is closed. They still need me to be there. They can't give me money while I sit at home. You can't ask for leave? No. Maybe a maid? That costs money. She has money. You want our mother to use her own money. What's wrong with that? So you sit over in America and do nothing while well, I'm the one over here taking care of her. If I could be there, I would, but the government doesn't allow Americans in. Then why haven't you sent a single cent over? For what? For your own mother who has cancer. I'm not going to blindly send you money. It's for her. You control all her expenses. Are you saying I'd steal her money? No, I'm saying I don't know what I'm giving you money for. Does she not have enough money for a maid? You'd seriously make her pay out of pocket? Then what's the use of her money? If she has none, I'll gladly send some over. You just want to sit over there with all your money and keep it for yourself. I'm not drowning in money. How do you say guitar in English? Guitar. How about this? Give 275,000 to Hanhai. Give 25,000 to Han Zhang. And what about this part? I abandon my family for a better life. Go on. I'm a traitor to my own kind. I'm learning so much from you, big brother. Please teach me more about the good life. I'm not drowning in money. I'm a hard worker, yet I still get fired for reasons I don't know. It's never enough. You don't think I work hard? That hard work gives you enough money to think buying an iPhone is nothing. An iPhone costs my whole year's salary. You have your house given to you. You can't be fired. You can retire at 55 while I have to wait till 70 so I can keep my health insurance. You think I got an easy life? You should grab him by the collar. You don't have an easy life. You have a good life. He's about to punch Ba. Shushu. Shushu realizes he's holding his nephew, Zhao Fei, by the collar. He loosens his grip. He stops struggling. They look at each other. Zhao Fei slowly removes himself from Shu Shu's grip. You don't have to honor the will. <laughs> Take the money. The fact you don't fight for it. That kind of money means nothing to you, doesn't it? I'll honor it. Two days before she died. She asked for fish and dumplings. I couldn't find it in the market, so I went downtown and bought it. She ate two of them for dinner and nothing else. Her father left, so I was the only one to take care of her. Has anyone ever thanked me for my work? She still thought higher of a son who was never even there for her. You come here a few years ago to reconnect and you talk to her and you think you're close to her after three months. It's nothing compared to the years I have cared for her. She was my responsibility. You think you are, but you are not one of us. Shushu drops the wheel on the ground and leaves, going downstairs. Nai rises. What about when you went to Shanghai? You ask so many questions. Every day you're always asking me questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no one has really asked me about my past so much. 
is good. I'm curious. You've lived and seen so much. I've lived enough. It's already been six years since your grandfather passed. There's not much point to keep on living, isn't there? Oh, whoa. When I die, you must come back to Nanchan and find my will. I put it in the center of the desk. My, my. In the center of the middle drawer. There, you'll find it. And don't tell your Shushu. He doesn't know? No. Don't tell him. Okay. I wrote the will a while back. I've been meaning to tell you. It's important you carry this out. I'll do exactly what you tell me to. Thank you. Are you ever going to tell Shushu? What's that outside? Yeah. It's it's just a funeral. Someone died. It's a funeral outside? Why is there a blue tent? Oh, it's all just their traditions. That's how they do it. I think I'm going to go downstairs and check it out. Go ahead. It's nothing special. It happens all the time. I'll come back soon. Nai Nai goes to the window and looks out. Bells chime outside. We gradually shift back to the 1960s. We hear the sound of children running around and laughing, mingled with revolutionary music. She picks up the will on the ground, crumples it up, and throws it away. Nai Nai is happy. Nai Nai is herself. Han Xiang! Han Hai! Dinner is ready! Come back inside! Welcome once again to our Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists space, our virtual space, to our Healing Over Hate series. And we're also, of course, grateful to HowlRound Theater Commons uh, for their partnership with us in offering their virtual platform as we bring forth this series. Um, today, we have the great honor and fortune of hosting a couple of guests. Yeah. But before we do that, I want to remind you always, please go to kata.net in case you'd like to become a member. We'd love to have you join us. And of course, we're always grateful and welcome donations. Once again, kata.net. You'll also find all our other updates there as well. So as we do here, we'd like to acknowledge the land upon which we are set. So I encourage you to take a moment of reflection and notice where you are. Today, I am zooming in from the land of the Gabrielino, Tongva, and Chumash peoples, and many other nations throughout California. And it's important to note that we honor the cultures, traditions, and languages of all Native Indigenous peoples. We also work to be in right relations with all the Native Indigenous leaders and artistic uh, uh, theater makers that we work with and certainly in our communities as well. And we wanna honor the way uh, indigenous and native folks also govern uh, their communities and work respectfully with them on that score. It's also important to note that um, many of us are here certainly in a virtual platform and there are many folks streaming in and use, utilizing technology that leaves a carbon footprint impacting the climate contributing to climate change that most negatively affects indigenous communities. And we're utilizing broadband internet that native indigenous communities often lack access to. And it's important to recognize that we must go beyond just acknowledgement and language 
that is the baseline, actually, of the work we can do. Um, so I invite you to learn and respect um, to, and take actions and build authentic relationships to support the authority of Native Indigenous peoples and honor their sovereignty, nations, tribes, communities. Native Indigenous peoples are not just of the past. They are still here. And we honor their resilience. They exist brilliantly now and well into the future. So with that, if you haven't already, uh, please acknowledge the lands upon which you are set and deepen your relationships with the uh, Native and Indigenous peoples in your communities. I say uh, also thank you for that. And for me, for my culture, for that effort and those uh, commitments. So with that, uh, it's my honor and pleasure once again to be back here with the Healing Over Hate series. And thank you also to Theater Communications Group who has also supported uh, bringing about this series. It's been tremendous. We've been able to have upstander, bystander, de-escalation and self-defense training. We've learned about the history of anti-Asian hate in this country and uh, all the way up to this moment. And um, recognizing, of course, since the um, recent administration and a lot of the rhetoric that really started to kick up anti-Asian hate and violence, um, this series has become really vital and important. We're artists, but we're also social justice workers and we're committed to social justice at, at Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists. So with that, um, recognizing we're in this time of um, anti-Asian hate and violence, we're still working to end that and with other anti-blackness and anti-oppression against indigenous and Latinx peoples and mixed race peoples. Um, it's important to continue this conversation. So I have two guests, as I mentioned. It's my honor and pleasure to bring on screen Victor Malana Maog, who has been our president and vice president at Kata. So really the president and vice president emeritus. So welcome. Victor, thanks for being back with us here at Kata. In fact, I never feel like you've left. <laughs> nice to see you, Leslie. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you. And then I'd love to bring on Ryan Chen. Ryan is on the steering committee of Gapinmi, uh, an organization empowering queer and trans Asian Pacific Islanders. And here we are in Pride Month, but to me, Pride Month is every month. And it's an honor to have you with us here with Kata, Brian. And um, one of the things that's been important during this difficult time, right, is to make sure we're remembering some of the most vulnerable in our communities. So uh, why don't we start there? We're in such a difficult time, but I'd like to learn more straight from you about Gapinmi and your work and what we can do to support our most vulnerable in our communities. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I would just like to give a little bit of background uh, about Compemni. Uh, we were founded in 1990. We're all uh, an all volunteer based uh, community organization. Um, you know, we're, we're we have the mission to empower queer and Asian, uh, queer and trans Asian American Pacific Islanders to create positive change. And uh, we provide a range of political, social, educational, and cultural programs and work in coalition with other uh, community organizations like yours um, to educate and promote dialogue on issues of race, sexuality, gender, and health. So, you know, uh, in, in this time of the pandemic, um, a lot of things have to, has gone virtual, but also the most vulnerable members of our community often are, are people who are, uh, who, who, who have lost the ability to get um, to to get money to put on the table, and um, you know because either they're excluded workers, so people who are not going to be even covered by you know the the the, the stimulus and all of that things. So or 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 you know black and trans uh, siblings who are also vulnerable and excluded for other reasons. So. Um, we've done fun, uh, we've done basically mutual aid in terms of fundraising 
to raise funds from our community that go that can go directly to help support um, people during this difficult kind of time because they just need money <laughs> very often. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, Gifami has done in the past year. Um, I, as a member and a, a person who can, who was on the steering committee, who can use this uh, organization as platform, has also um, in, been um, involved in uh, collaborating with Kiln Pacific Beats and um, working on programming that ties in theater with uh, te teachings of abolition and what it looks like to deeply be more involved in uh, theater, local theater. Wow, such important work, Ryan. Thank you for your service. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I appreciate you work with Kion at Pacific Bay. That's an, um, uh, fantastic. And um, I, I, I'm learning that you've worked with Victor too, yeah? And you talked about theater, telling the stories and really hearing it straight from these important voices in our community. That, that's, uh, we're learning it's critical in the theater field as we get more inclusive and really, uh, really committed toward justice. It means by and for us, right? And even in problem solving now I say include this. So how important is that we're connecting with, with uh, pin me during these times but going forward too yeah thank you for being with us and victor can, can you both talk to me a little bit about how you work together when i started in 2012 as a new artistic director of 2g i was working with kyung park and we had come up with a project around community voices working with pin me and other um, other organizations around around a writing program to give voices to those who were marginalized. And that was led by our master, our sort of master teacher, if you will, Dean, who actually is participating in, in Inflections. Ryan was part of that program. So it's really, really cool to reconnect with you, uh, Ryan, and around this project. We wanted to uplift the, the great service of the Pitney and also other organizations like the Buddy System in New York. And that's how we started. And eventually that Community Voices program uh, translated itself into another program that we hold now, which is a writing program in residence with Stuyvesant High School, where we have students write their very first plays. So it's it's really come a, a full circle here today. Oh, beautiful. That's um, deep in community, which I love. And um, thank you, Victor. You are uh, the former right artistic director at Second Generation Productions 2G and uh, currently executive producer and curator on this new, um, this new program you wanna offer. Yeah? Yeah, it's, uh, 2G was founded in 1997 by Welly Yang. There was a time where folks were only getting parts in Miss Saigon. And what happened to stories where we had much more complexity, much more opportunities to take on leads. And so out of that moment, Welly said, we want to put artists on the world stage and 2G was born. And 2, 2G's uh, mission is really to create world-class theater that goes across generations and racial divides. It's also to co cultivate a new generation of Asian American artists. And in, in the great multiplicity and range that that is and to connect with new and underrepresented artists. And what we've done through the years is work on developed plays, community building program, programs, just like the Community Voices. But we've also started to work inward, quietly, how to reinvest in our own writers, giving them sort of the time and space away from the spotlight to give them what they need, whether it's a workshop, whether it's just funds for, for their own development. Um, and so we've always been artist-centered and community-centered. and in this particular time, uh, 2021, we knew we needed to respond with art. That was immediate, that came out of some of the, the horrific events 
that just came by. I mean, the, th the things that gutted all of us. Um, and, that's, and that's how the program Inflections came to be. It really came out of um, a need to use art to have a conversation around the fullness of who we are. Uh, it, it was really a necessity. Oh, I think that's so powerful because I think a lot of the racism that we're enduring, unfortunately having to endure, is so based on stereotypes and they just keep replicating and coming back around, right? So to see the fullness and, and rehumanize us is so critical. That yeah. was the prompt. The prompt was really moving away from sort of a documentary theater uh, model of what does all this violence do to you, but really to go, what is living a life in who you are? How can we place that on stage? And so we asked, um, six artists to work on that. Um, you know, real range in terms of age, in terms of just backgrounds, and in terms of aesthetics. And we wanted, of course, we couldn't capture everybody, but we tried to do what we could in this time span. It's a, they're able to do it in 15 minutes. It's a 15 minute piece. They were going to rehearse it and record it within a four hour window with no more than four actors. And it had to respond to this idea of inflections, curvatures, arcs, undulations of milestones, of moments of a life. And the, the plays that they've come forward with, uh, with are, are just beautiful, heartbreaking, and in a way really respond to a striving to live a striving to live and, um, and frankly, getting up after we've been pushed down. You know, that's, that's the great resiliency in this crit critical moment. Uh, and that's why I'm so thankful to, to Kata and HowlRound for inviting us into this Healing Over Hate series, because we know that this is an important forum around connection and also the global reach of the of the project so i really want to thank you for that and I, I, we've worked together in the past leslie so uh, you said yes immediately and i'm so grateful for that uh, ryan said yes immediately to speaking about his work and gapitney's work um, and it's that sort of partnership that's that's kept 2g going and frankly afloat we're small we don't have huge funds but we do have a, a range of uh, a network that we really rely on and are there for us Beautiful, beautiful. This is powerful work you all are doing. Uh, Ryan, how is it to work with Victor? <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't exactly work with Victor in, directly. It was more Kyung who did most of the um, coordination. For me, I was just a, I actually ended up being one of the playwrights. So I worked on my first play as a result of the project. So outcome was that. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, I mean, I discovered that I have chops to be a write writer, and it's fascinating to to learn how to how to write plays. I guess so. Yeah, it was, I was grateful for that opportunity. Um, I find that for me, I've discovered that writing is a form of healing for me. It it can be useful as therapy, you know, theater as therapy. And I do also feel that um, when we can tell our stories, we can also heal. So I, I believe that, you know, this work is important for us to see our stories be represented, but also be able to have the artists be able to heal with uh, being able to tell their stories, you know, diversify the, you know, the intersections of our identities to finally make the, um, the nuanced like differences so that I, I like, I feel like one of the problems is uh, uh, we don't get to play uh, roles that are, you know, um, fiction and have us be like, well, that's not actually my story people over identify, you know, people who are, for example, trans get to play trans characters and then 
and then be just assume that they're just playing themselves versus a, you know people who aren't trans playing a trans character being getting accolades you know so mm -hmm. we have enough stories to represent the different types and properly cast them then we can actually finally get people to understand that it it's a beautiful performance as opposed to um, you are playing yourself, which isn't always true, right? Like I write stories that sort of touch on a feeling, but not necessarily assume that that is actually exactly the story that I'm telling is an autobi autobiographical story. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, we know representation is huge. Uh, being able to play of your own identity or intersections of your identity, so critical. It affirms your humanity. And if you don't see yourself, the injury it causes, right? We're just starting to really understand how to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, so, so Ryan, you're a part of this Inflections project. How, how incredible. Beautiful. Victor, will you tell us more about Inflections? Inflections is five projects. I'll tell you about the writers involved. Yes. We have Jade Wu, who's written a, a play called Darwin's Arch. Max Yu has written Distance Abandoned. And oftentimes it is about some of the stories have to deal with losing oneself or even the sense of responsibility in, um, in the family. Mm. Dean has written a story called A Story, a play in 20 measures that has uh, the, the way that he describes it is, is a story about the families we make, sometimes out of thin air, but always out of full hearts. And Ren Dara Santiago writes about two Filarican sisters really unfolding patterns about themselves in a series of FaceTime calls. And finally, we have a new piece by Philip Khan Gatanda and Shinji Ashima, a song, sort of a song that is called Body of Eyes. It's about a couple that wonders about their decision not to have children. So even in those snapshots, you'll start to see the range and depth and complexity of what it means just to be alive through these very, very um, stunning writers. Um, and there's great laughter in there, but also there's also great resiliency. And all under such limited time to write this work. And I will say, they, they've all put themselves on the line. They've really, they really haven't missed this opportunity to use their art to respond. Many of the artists, the artists, the, the writers, the the editors, the actors, they've all said, at this time, I want to be in this community. And close to 40 artists are joining for this project. And so they didn't want to miss their chance to have this conversation. Um, and that's what I'm really, really interested in. Just like uh, the opportunities with Ryan, we brought the folks in, we gave them some parameters and then let their imaginations go wild. So I, I can't wait to see what they've come up with. Uh, in the final product. Oh, that's fantastic. We know when you give artists parameters, they often create magnificently, right? So you've given them this challenging framework to work in. That's amazing. Um, oh my goodness. Thank you both for being of service to our communities. We know how powerful art can be uh, for the artists themselves creating the work and in collaboration, coming out of isolation, especially during this pandemic. But also for us as audience, I am certain it's going to be the healing we need while, while there's such hate going on. We hope to keep healing so we can keep eradicating hate, right? Yes. So, uh, oh my gosh, thank you so much for joining me um, for this session and uh, helping us to learn more about inflection so that we can go forth and, and uh, support it, view it. Um, can you tell us as we go out now, Victor, can you share with us some of the details about inflection, how people can view it? And then um, Ryan, too, if there's any last thing you would like to share 
of course, I want to have your voice included in our closing. Thank you, Leslie. So Inflections actually will have its premiere on HowlRound TV uh, from June 28th through June 30th. So you can find it on HowlRound. You could also catch it on Facebook Live through the Kata site. So that is June 28th through the 30th. You can catch Inflections. And you can also find out more on 2G.org and kata.net. Thank you for that. Any last thoughts, Ryan, for now? Um, yeah, hey, if anyone's interested, uh, you can follow Gipami on, on uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram and uh, get involved in other ways beyond theater at Sweat Your Heart. Cool. Beautiful. And I know Gipimi said on your face, uh, your, your website, it says Justice, Pride, Solidarity. Thank you for that work. We support that here at Kata, absolutely. And we look forward to being in partnership more. So thank you so much for joining us to our audience. And thank you to Victor and Ryan for, for being with me here. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Okay, and we encourage our audiences, of course, be safe, uh, wear masks when it's necessary, when you're asked to, and if you're inclined, we encourage you to get vaccinated so we can get back to live theater, and of course, just being in connection with each other in person. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody.